judiciary in India, in many ways, have functioned from the independence as the protector of our democracy. It's actually the uh, safeguard for our constitution. That's the provision we have made. And uh, yet, judiciary has many flaws also. And there are judges who have never shied away from candidly talking about these flaws. And today, uh, we have with us two of the Supreme Court judges, uh, very renowned judges, who have often been leveled as rebels as well. So I'd like to introduce first Justice J. Salamayaswar, former Chief Justice, uh, former Supreme Court judge, and Justice Korean Joseph, former Supreme Court judge. They were both colleagues, and if you all remember, they were part of that famous uh, press conference on January 12, uh, 2018, uh, which was unprecedented in many ways. Uh, I'll first come to Justice Chalameswar and uh, the topic today as we are talking about judicial um, executive overreach versus uh, judicial independence. Uh, the current uh, debate is about judicial appointment, appointment of the judges. And interestingly, you were the one who actually supported that executive uh, law, that law passed by parliament uh, about appointment of judges, uh, National Judicial Commission appointment. And interestingly, just if uh, uh, Joseph later, who uh, said that he regrets uh, opposing that bill or that act. So first question is to Justice Chalameswar, how do you see the current situation? Now, the current situation that uh, the debate is going on and uh, the way uh, the former law minister actually levels some of the Supreme Court judges as anti-national uh, and this uh, okay, <laughs> he didn't name anyone, but if you are trying to take... I uh, said, I said I topped the list perhaps. <laughs> but uh, how do you see this debate? What's the way out now? Uh, because uh, the, the government is delaying many appointments. They are even uh, uh, picking up peculiar reasons like the sexual orientation of a judge uh, to, to negate the appointment. Uh, so, in, under these circumstances, do you think that uh, you did the wrong by, not, by opposing that uh, bill? No, I don't think I did anything wrong in writing the dissenting judgment. Please remember, it was a bill passed by the parliament unanimously. If I remember right, only one, one vote went against that bill. Ms. Chidambaram will correct me. I think it's Ramjat Malani who voted against that bill. Rest of them, including Ms. Chidambaram, supported that bill. No, this question is not one of party, this party or that party. In constitutional law, as a student of constitutional law, I found it difficult to believe that an elected government, irrespective of the hue of the government, which party it is, which name it carries, would have no say at all in the matter of the appointment of judges of this country is something as a student of constitutional law I never understood in a democratic country. Forget about less democratic countries is a different because this kind of a debate would never arise. Even in a democratic country, to tell them that you will not have any place in the matter, and I fail to understand that they are abusing that position. Some party or some minister is abusing or some minister is uh, abusing individual judges is a different story. But on a principle, I still believe that is a correct legal position and I, I have no reason to change my views. But the current Chief Justice, uh, Justice D.Y. Chandrachuri says that collegium system is the best. And you actually uh, declined to be part of the Collegium uh, yes. once you wrote to the CGI that you do not want, you, you cited lack of transparency. So could yes. you elaborate? One uh, incumbent Chief Justice is saying this is the best system. You, uh, you alleged uh, lack of transparency. Yes, I did. But why? I Means how do you, how do you, um, uh, how do you respond to this uh, statement that it is the best possible system, that Collegium system is the best possible system for uh, appointment of judges. Sorry, and it's not very clear. Can you can you come and keep it slightly away? Yeah, I am asking you, how do you respond to this uh, uh, statement that collegium system is the best possible system for judicial appointments? I don't agree with it. I never agreed with it. But why? I gave the reasons because the process is absolutely opaque. Quite a large number of decisions. Uh, nobody understands why they are taken. You want concrete example, but that will annoy a lot of people, a lot of unpleasantness will be generated. 
I can take one man anyway. I don't want to put others yeah, in. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. See, this is once again. It happened all the time. Not only in the last ten years. Earlier also. Notwithstanding the declaration that the Supreme Court judgment, collegium is the last word. Quite often we see that some recommendations are made, they are not acted upon. Time later, the collegium withdraws the recommendation. Now what does it indicate? What does it indicate? So therefore, do you still think it is the best uh, mechanism available for appointment? There is something fundamentally wrong with the logic. So what is more important is the process is made more transparent, there will be some amount of accountability. That transparency is missing. That's my complaint, therefore I abstain from that. Justice Joseph, do you still regret that decision, sir? You are right, Mr. Kaushik. I said uh, in a um, platform which I shared with Mr. Justly that uh, I would rather start regretting now. Reason was that I firmly believed, and I do still believe, that the independence of judiciary will be better protected if the collegium system is followed. But how does this collegium system uh, function? That is the big question. In fact, uh, if any one of you would have read uh, the last paragraph of my separate judgment in the NJC, both of us were part of the NJC, I have said that uh, the system requires a transparency there should be a secretariat. It's all in the hands of just one uh, assistant, one who is now a registrar now, one person who has been the secretariat in the collegium for, the, I think, for the over 20 years now in the Supreme Court. Only one person. Nobody else knows. As years, to, 30 years, 93. Maybe around 30 years. Just to tell Mr. she says, only one person. He handles all the files of um, all the judges, <laughs> in the country, and uh, only he is... We said, you know, in fact, uh, Justice Lokur, Justice Salamis, Justice Lokur, and just me, all three of us said, no, this is not the way this should function. But having said that, and having upheld the independence of judiciary and struck down the National Judicial Appointment Commission, the picture I saw in the country was uh, certainly disappointing. Disappointing in the sense, I agree the government should have yes say, but the say is the problem. Every decision that was taken by the collegium was just, uh, just a farce. The, I really understand that the, the decision actually was taken some other quarters, and it was <laughs> and it only simply endorsed by the collegium. This is where I said the, the, the commission that was suggested would have been better. In that sense, I said, I regret. It would have been more independent. It has become absolutely under the control of um, the executive, which was, uh, according to me, 100% uh, overreach. And how do you see that famous press conference? Do you think you achieved the goals that you wanted to achieve through that press conference, or you think that was unnecessary, or you missed the main objective? To both, sir. First, uh, Justice uh, Joseph. I, I don't mind starting, absolutely no problem. To me, it's a story of, um, it was a story of great expectations, but it turned out to be a story of lost expectations. Justice Salem as well. So far as I am concerned, there was no purpose to be achieved by this press conference in that narrow sense of it. We believed that there are certain things which were not going right. We tried our best to set the course correction. We realized it was beyond our ability for various reasons which I may not be able to discuss now. In which case, the thing is, I thought at least the people of this country are required to know that's something. Well, afterwards, it's for the people to decide what to do with it. Ultimately, all these institutions, all these offices, in my view, exist for the people of this country. 
And uh, in fact, there's an old uh, this thing, I don't know how many of us remember it. In some meeting with uh, the Viceroy, the Viceroy told Gandhiji, Bapu, this requires a confidential discussion. Well, Gandhiji asked him, what is so confident? Matter of state affairs. Gandhiji asked him, whose state is this? He asked. That is still the relevant question. The state doesn't, is not a mythical animal. It's all of us together constitute the state. And these are the affairs of the state which are required to be known by the people of this country. Now, my views may not be the right views. My views may not be the final views. Today people may accept it. Today people may reject it. But as a free citizen of this country, which I believe I am a free citizen, I am entitled to put my views on a record. I placed it on record and my brothers agreed with me that day. I didn't force anybody, of course, the picture was being painted that I dragged these innocent people to that press because the venue was my residence. In fact, I, in fact, I offered that day to let the venue be some other place, I don't want to mention the name. And then everybody said, no, 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 brother, you are the senior most among four of us, it's your place. I said, fair enough. That doesn't mean I drag these people against their wish there. But is everything all right in the Supreme Court now? Hmm? Is everything all right in the Supreme Court now? How do you see the Supreme Court I, I and its role? I don't know. I'll tell you something, Mr. Deka. It may not be a very wonderful thing to tell you people. I don't have a TV at my residence. It's 12 years since I watched the TV. And I stopped buying newspapers five years back. Of course, I still uh, watch the important pop-ups in the telephone. So, you ask me how the Supreme Court is now, I perhaps may not be the right person to answer. Ask the Justice Korean, Joseph, maybe, maybe would you like to answer the question? Hmm? Is the Supreme See, Court both, both all right us, now? Yeah, yeah. Both of us were Chief Justices um, in the high courts of um, uh, states. Uh, Justice Chalameshwar was in Kerala and uh, I was in Himadil for three years and the brother was, uh, I think, 18 months. Was. 18 months, yes. See, there is something called Master of Roast, the Chief Justice. He decides which case should go before which bench. This is a very important uh, jurisdiction of the uh, system. I don't want to say the Chief Justice. To me, I was quite clear when I went for the press conference that uh, this will send some message as to how the system should function in the Supreme Court and in the High Court. Unlike the High Court, where you have, you know, little more homogeneity, where in the Supreme Court, you know, people come from different states, and uh, though we call each other brother and sister, I don't know how much uh, that uh, uh, collegiality and fraternity and warmth, affection, etc., are there. And so it's a big question. You can read from the smile of my brother. Yes, we uh, function in our own spheres there unlike the high courts, where we have regular um, meetings, etc. You won't believe, uh, uh, Brother Talamesh, sir, in your uh, six-year term, how many full courts were there? Maybe two, three? In the Supreme Court. Supreme Court? Supreme Court, three or four. Maybe three, six years. Whereas in the high court, in the state, uh, there will be a full court at least... Um, once in two months? Once in two or maximum three months, yes, definitely. Even in the largest... Uh, High Court of Alhamad also, I checked, there are full courts because see, these are institutional decisions uh, which we have to take. It does not and should not depend on one person. If it depends on one person, then becomes, it's called arbitrariness. This is, which is the something that we should avoid, particularly in that institution. So that was one thing which I strongly advocated and I hoped will be there be corrective measures. And for your information, which we have not shared anywhere else, post this press conference, uh, we had uh, meetings uh, uh, several days, where we included uh, all the incoming chief justices, including the present uh, chief justice, was part of our uh, in-house meetings, as what could be the corrective measures which we could take to put systems and practices in the place of uh, a person alone taking a decision. There were several suggestions, uh, and all suggestions, uh, of course, there's no question of any somebody taking a decision, but we thought these uh, discussions would help all the incoming chief justices thereafter. Um, 
to streamline some sort of a system in the Supreme Court as far as uh, this uh, distribution of work is concerned. There have been judges, you won't believe, who despite being in the Supreme Court, the normal term of a judge in the Supreme Court is maybe around four, or four years. Brother had uh, six plus years and um, me um, five years and eight months or so. There have been judges who never ever had a chance to head a constitution bench, who was never part of a constitution bench. And there have been judges who have been heading the constitution bench um, uh, in benches in the Supreme Court successively for quite a few times also. So this was something which we need to um, streamline on the, in the interest of the institution. This was one great thing and one most important thing which I had in my mind when I won that point. Because that was the triggering point also, the way decisions were taken in the distribution of work in Supreme Court. It was absolutely uh, in the hands of uh, one person. There was no consultation at all, which I said is not good for uh, an institution like judiciary. But I regret I did not see, and uh, rather I'm sorry, I did not see any signs of change uh, thereafter. I hope and pray that um, the present incumbent in the office, um, who is well aware of our discussions and who himself had noted certain ideas, would uh, keep in mind what he had suggested and um, take the institution forward in the interest of administration of justice. I, I may just add a couple of sentences. Over a period of 75 years, in the institution of the Supreme Court, a great paradox has come into existence. The highest court of the country, in my view, in fact, I stated so in, on more than one occasion, should sit as one body while laying down the law. On the other hand, we have 16 or 17 Supreme Courts to date, division benches, 14, 15 division benches, and then what happens thereafter, the lawyers know, the conflicting views and for every conflict in view, there is a reference to a large adventure, large adventure to five, seven, nine judges. I think there are quite a few matters which are to be adjudicated by the nine judges for the last two decades. The, that bench was never constituted. On the administrative side, though originally under the letter of the constitution, the Supreme Court had any, hardly any administrative functions in the sense of high courts by an express provision have administrative superintendents over all the courts and tribunals within the territory over which the High Court exercises jurisdiction. Such a provision is not there. It's not a supervising court over the High Courts. For various reasons, historic reasons, it so happened, quite some, some power uh, came to be vested in the hands of the Supreme Court, quote-unquote, whatever it means today. There, my belief is the minute the court is exercising administrative power, like transferring of judges, appointing of judges, so on and so forth, it is the wisdom of the whole court that is required to be taken into consideration, not one individual. I can give you one, just one example, which is now it's all irrelevant today. When all that uh, turmoil was going on, there were some complaints about a particular judge of a particular high court. A lot of things happened. It appears that the then Chief Justice of India ordered for an in-house inquiry against that particular judge. None of us, I was number J1, he was J3, none of us knew that such an inquiry was ordered. I mean, would you accept this kind of a system on the political front if the chief minister were to decide everything or the prime minister were to decide everything? Now, the members of the cabinet are so subservient not to discuss things with their chief minister or prime minister, as the case may be. That's a different matter. But are we willing to live in a country like that, where all the decisions are taken by one individual? On a principle, it is wrong. The time-tested uh, statement for millennia all over the world is concentration of power is always dangerous to the people. All the constitutional systems are designed to avoid that kind of a constitutional, uh, that kind of a concentration of power. And then we come up with this formula, where from it came, God alone knows, of course, it requires a whole debate, half an hour is not possible to finalize. That is the basic paradox in the thing. What ought to be done by the entire court is done by one individual. 
what ought to be done by the entire what ought to be done by individuals is done by the entire court all kinds of things happen that's all now um, about judicial overreach recently the supreme court is uh, hearing that same sex uh, marriage case and the government is saying that it's it's a kind of judicial overreach because uh, the parliament needs to uh, legislate on such issues what's your opinion do you think that it was a judicial overreach or the cgi did the right thing by hearing those petitions well i don't want to talk about uh, same sex marriage because it's a pending case but on a principle i can talk see the prime minister is saying present prime minister past prime minister politicians with due respect to mr chidambaram and his uh, friends in politics they talk in different tones when they are in power and when they are in opposition as mr chidambaram was pointing out in the previous session the watershed from his point of view is bomai's case till bomai's case in this country nobody believed that the decision of the president to dismiss a government is justiciable for the first time the supreme court in bomai's case said something but what happened even after all that uh, there's a long judgment finally none of the nine and four or five states the governments were restored and we know all this thing same thing happened in maharashtra after the grand declaration the factual consequence didn't follow now when the supreme court gave that judgment in bombay those who were not in power that day welcomed it saying that this is a very progressive judgment this is uh, the high constitutional principle is upheld and i'm sure uh, if, if somebody else were to come to come to power tomorrow the story would be the same so therefore let us not get into this lakshman rekha business is all rhetoric the only lakshman rekha which i know is the constitution itself constitution has made clear provisions delineating the functions of each one of the three organs the legislature executive and judiciary it is there in the constitution how we understand it and how we are twist but don't go by this the ad hoc statement somebody has crossed. when i don't like something which the executive does i say when i i, I presume i'm still in office anyway as the executive has crossed the lakshman these are all rhetoric statements but as a former judge sir, of mm. the supreme court how yeah. do you see this the lakshman rekha in this case has been breach or not which which case? in this same sex uh, I, do, i told you i'm not going to comment on it it's a pending matter i the don't question is whether the supreme court had the right to hear these petitions well certainly it has a jurisdiction but question is whether the priority see if i were to be the, the judge or the chief judge hypothetically the what would be the priority i know as a matter of fact there are appeals against appeals preferred by convicts who are suffering life sentence for the last 10 years the appeals are pending in the supreme court if we believe really in the constitutional values my principle is top priority should be given to that because nothing like uh, personal freedom after 10 years you uh, let us say in a given case the supreme court comes to the conclusion the person the man or woman is innocent what benefit it is those 10 years are lost to that person priority should be given how do you prioritize the hearing is a question on that ground i have reservations about this matter justice joseph you have very strong views about issues like abortion divorce uh, in this case do you think that the lakshman rekha was breached by the supreme court in trying to hear these cases these petitions on same sex marriages uh, kaushik uh, you yourself gave me a hint saying that i have my very strong personal views about it i do have but disassociating myself with uh, what is said now uh being handled by the supreme court of course is a matter pending consideration by supreme court uh, i would say that you know marriage has a different purpose also marriage is a union of man and woman basically essentially now there is an association and uh, united forever for um, purposes of uh, the nature procreation and the creation well that is my personal view about it so i am 100% against uh, this same sex marriage it can be a union can be an association it can be whatever because nobody it's not a fundamental right marriage is not a fundamental right of a person so you can have uh, uh, your own choice as to whether you want to be living to the to be a friend close friend intimate friend particular friend living for together forever etc those are all different uh, concepts out of the moment you touch on the concept of marriage it is talk is actually the basic unit in the society 
So when we speak about the, 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 the unity, if we speak about the um, uh, integration, et cetera, no, it's all something which affects the roots of the issue. That is my personal feeling. But since you asked about the jurisdiction aspect, I do not say that there is no jurisdiction. But I agree with my island brother that, you know, jurisdiction depends on the discretion that you exercise as to which you should exercise your jurisdiction and which you should refrain from. Because ultimately, as an institution, your role is to have a judicial review on the law, policy, and conduct of the legislature and the executive. And of course, the judiciary also. Because there's a judicial review of the judiciary as well. There are several provisions in the procedure laws and the constitution also. As uh, Brother pointed out, uh, the, uh, the, the, the I quote uh, jurisdiction under Article 235 is to oversee the administration of justice in the state, unlike the Supreme Court, which does not have any such jurisdiction. So there, in the matter of administration of justice, this uh, institution should uh, function on that uh, manner. So your primary duty is to see whether the law is constitutional, the policy is constitutional, the conduct is constitutional. If you want to examine that, then there must be something which has been made either by the lawmaker or by the introduced by the executive and then you have to see whether this is a policy which is uh, constitutionally valid and uh, to be upheld. That's scrutiny that you don't get. And you don't get a platform where, because law, what is law? Law is actually, a, we call it a mirror of life. It's actually meant to order the society, to create order in society and prevent disorder in society. So this is actually a province. It's a, I always say people's court, not the judiciary. It's a court of the people where they should have debate, they should know, because it is such a, uh, the, the, the diversity of this country where we have religions, cults, because this essentially has a lot of uh, um, uh, intimate uh, and intricate relationship into the culture, into the religion, into the, to the beliefs of uh, people. So all these are to be, according to me, debated and then, you know, a policy uh, needed to have been taken. That would have been a better way of looking at it, but since the matter is now in the court, uh, I do not want to comment any further on that. My last question as we are running out of time, so brief answers. My little understanding of law says that bail is the norm and uh, jail should be the aberrations. But now we see that in most cases, the bails are denied and the executive in many cases, irrespective of political dispensation, they use this provision not to grant bail, uh, to make the process itself a punishment. We have, and and it, it's being used now politically also. There are several examples. We have uh, one example here, Mr. P. Chidambaram ji. So this is happening increasingly from the common citizen to political opponents. The executive is taking advantage of this judicial, uh, uh, judicial disinterested in giving bails. Uh, how do you see that can be sold? What would be your suggestion for the judges, particularly in the lower courts? They just do not give bails, where the provisions say that in most cases it should be the norm. How do you see that can be solved, sir? Uh, Justice Salam, Mr. Sir, there is no provision which says it should be the norm. Barring a judgment of the Justice uh, Krishnayar, which said bail is the rule and jail is the exception. But the point is, apart from those high-sounding words, a system which takes number of years to adjudicate the guilt or otherwise of an accused person, Bail should be the norm, agree, logically. Now, the only other way we can get rid of that norm is improve the efficiency of the system that, that trial in no case shall be pending in any court for more than two, two months, three months, or whatever it is. We can raise the level of the efficiency of the system to that, which is, you know, is a huge task. Mr. Chidambaram is smiling at me with all his experience as a lawyer, lawmaker, parliamentarian, and so on and so But that is the problem. There are in fact, there are some high courts, without meaning any disrespect to them, where criminal appeals of life convicts are pending for two decades. In fact, in one case, when I was sitting there in the Supreme Court, 
we said we called for reports and we asked certain reform and whatever it is, the thing is going on. Unfortunately, the kind of prominence which is given to these uh, same-sex marriages and so on and so forth, they are more, uh, uh, I don't know, one wrong word, I might get into trouble once again. But these are the things which gain a lot of prominence and publicity. The problem of these people who languish in jails under trials for a number of years, I mean, that's not uh, being addressed. I think that's more, something more important for the nation, for the common man of this country. Now, instead of addressing it now, in a particular case, bail is granted, not granted, it's being used. By, naturally, everybody tries to take advantage of the existing system. That's what happens. Justice Joseph, final answer, same question. Yes, uh, see, we must uh, have a clear distinction as to this uh, concept of why a person should be in jail. Of course, post-conviction, if he's sentenced to imprisonment, yes. But pre-trial, there are definite norms because this affects the civil liberty and the dignity of the person. This is where people, uh, unfortunately, the system does not understand. The moment a person is uh, uh, pre-arrest, uh, sorry, um, pre-conviction uh, and pre-trial, somebody is arrested and uh, you know, put in jail, it affects his uh, dignity, it affects his uh, liberty, it affects his psyche as such. So unless there are compelling reasons for somebody to be kept in jail before trial, one should not, according to me. But there are a system, that there are people who say, uh, used to say, ultimately these people will get away. But this is the only thing they should be getting reward. This is a very wrong approach. This is uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, should not be encouraged at all. The, there should be systems and practices um, the, the, the right from the Supreme Court up to the, the, the magistrate level. People should know what is the value of liberty and what is the price that this country has given for liberty. Then only we will be able to understand how precious it is and how, uh, how, how uh, seriously we must safeguard it, protect it and promote it. Unless for absolutely compelling reasons, one should not be put in jail pre-trial stage. It is in that context, uh, Justice Kushnair uh, very emphatically said, bail is the norm and jail is the exception. But as Kaushik said, it has become a tamasha now. It is the other way now. It is jail, it appears even to the system, the judiciary also, jail seems to be the norm and bail seems to be an exception. The way the prosecution also sometimes presents this story, that there are very serious things to be investigated. Yes, you do, but why should you interfere with the personal dignity and liberty of the person if you want to investigate? I don't want to say anything further on that, I would have said, but for the presence of somebody here, I would have said many things about that. Thank you, Justice Chalameswar and Justice Joseph. As usual, you are both forthright with your views. Thank you so much for being part of this conclave. Thank you very much, our panelists, for joining us here. It was truly an engaging session. I'd like to call upon stage to felicitate our guests here. Sandeep N, Sham Steel, and Suresh M from Sham Steel, please up on stage. A big round of applause, Justice Jasti Chalameshwar, former Supreme Court judge, Justice Korean Joseph, former Supreme Court judge, with an enriching conversation with Kaushik Dega. A big round of applause.